Hi, it's Brendan here. Before we get into this week's episode of The Brendan O'Neill Show, I just wanted to remind everyone about Spiked Supporters. Spiked Supporters is our thriving community of people who donate to Spiked. Anyone who gives £5 or more a month or £50 or more a year can become a Spiked Supporter and get access to a number of exciting perks. Spike supporters can comment on articles, get a discount on all items in our shop, and bookmark articles as you browse. Plus, you get free or discounted access to events. It was great to see so many Spike supporters at my recent live podcast with Julia Hartley Brewer, and we have plenty of exciting events in store for you. Spike supporters is our way of saying thank you to all of you who fund our work. Spike is completely free, and yet you still hand over your hard-earned cash to make sure that anyone, anywhere, can read us. We're really grateful for that. If you don't give to Spike yet, now is the perfect time to start. Just go to spiked-online.com slash supporters to set up your donation and your Spike supporters account. That's spiked-online.com slash supporters. The climate scene has been corrupted by some scientists who have shifted over to an activist mode and are doing activism under the mantle of science. I think it's very important, again, for scientists to call it like they see it. Scientists have to give an accurate portrayal of the certainties and uncertainties and risks and benefits of possible courses of action and not advocate for one or the other. Hello and welcome to The Brendan O'Neill Show with me, Brendan O'Neill. This is a podcast in which an esteemed guest joins me to talk about the big ideas, the bad ideas, the problems and the controversies of life in the early 21st century. In this episode, I am delighted to be joined by Stephen E. Coonan. Stephen is a theoretical physicist and the founding director of the Center for Urban Science at New York University. From 2009 to 2011, he was Undersecretary for Science in the Department of Energy in the Obama administration. Stephen has also worked as chief scientist at BP, and he has been an advisor to the National Science Foundation and the US Department of Defense. In recent years, he has developed what are referred to as climate skeptical views and has taken part in numerous debates on climate science. He is the author of the newly published book, Unsettled, What Climate Science Tells Us, What It Doesn't, and Why It Matters. So Stephen, let's talk about your book. I really want to jump in on the big issue, I suppose, which is the science, which always has the before it, the definitive science, apparently the final word, the gospel truth. And you kick your book off with this idea of the science and why it's a problematic idea. And it's something that I've been thinking about over the years because I've been on, I've seen demonstrations at which environmentalists will hold up banners saying, listen to the science or the science has spoken or, you know, various ways of saying this is what the science dictates that we must do. And it's always struck me as a non-scientist, by the way, it's always struck me as a pretty problematic way to see science and understand science. So you really get into some of that in your book. So we can we just kick off with you explaining why you think the idea of the science is problematic and not a good starting point for discussions about climate change? There is a legitimate climate science Mm -hmm. that tries to understand the climate and how it has changed and how it might change in the future. You can find that science in the basic scientific literature and in the observations. But what the public sees is at the end of a long game of telephone that starts with that information, but goes through the assessment reports to the summaries for policymakers in those reports and then on to the media and ultimately to the politicians Mm -hmm. and other people talking to the public. And there are so many opportunities and motives to distort what the real science says that that's why the uh, public dialogue uh, often reminds me of what you hear in The Princess Bride where one character says, you know, you keep using that word, but I don't think it means what you think it means. (laughs) Absolutely. And so let's talk a bit about when you first started to get doubts about the science, about the, what, what you've just described very well, the stuff that gets filtered through to us. So it starts off as one thing, and then by the time it gets to 
Joe Public, it's something quite different. It's something that's been slightly distorted, maybe manipulated, maybe ramped up for the fear factor. Let's talk about when you first started to have doubts about that end product, about the kind of things we all think we know about climate change, which is that it's absolutely disastrous. It's the end of the world as we know it. And mankind is primarily responsible for the whole thing. So you were doing some work for the American Physical Society in around 2013, and you were preparing, I think, a summary on where climate science is at and what niggled you what got to you what made you start thinking hold on things are a bit different than i had previously thought yeah so so that meeting was uh in january of 2014 and the american physical society asked me to recommend a rewrite of a statement they had made seven years earlier on climate change and what started to bother me were several things One was the realization of how divergent the models that were being used were, both from the data as well as from each other. Mm -hmm. Another was the realization, which I should have had uh, if I had really studied deeply in, in prior years, of just how complicated the climate system is and how small the human influences are that we're trying to understand. Uh, and then as we got into the dialogue uh, during that meeting, um, what I would say was the dissembling by some of the modelers about, you know, reasons why the models weren't exactly right and, well, you should ignore that or we could fix that by a little tweak here or there. Mm-hmm. So I came away with the sense that the science was nowhere near as settled as I had thought it was. On the question of what is referred to as the settled science, I want to come back later on to the question, to the whole contradiction in terms that settled science is. And I really want to dig down with, uh, with you on, on that question, because I think that's very interesting. But to begin with, let's, let's think about some of the things that many people presume to be settled. So one of the things that people presume to be settled is that humankind have had, has had a, an extraordinarily large impact on something like weather events. So, I meet young people all the time, people who are green leaning, they care about the future. You know, these are good people motivated by concerns for humankind. And one thing they will just simply take for granted is that what is sometimes referred to as weather of mass destruction or terrible weather events, they take it for granted that this is something that we have played a role in bringing about. So for example, the floods in Europe recently in Germany and and Belgium and other parts of Europe there was a presumption in much of the media coverage and in amongst some of the people I spoke to, well, you know, of course, this is because we drive too much and we fly too much and we've had this impact. And they make this connection between how we live and what happens uh, in the weather itself. And you call that into question. You call aspects of that into question in the very beginning of your book, which I think is one of the best ways in which it drags the reader into your your uh, counter narrative, I guess. Uh, so could you just give us a, a few examples of where you have found huge question marks over the idea that these kinds of events are impacted on significantly by mankind. So climate is not weather, or weather is not climate. Weather is what happens every day, uh, maybe every year, but climate, according to official definitions, plays out over decades, over 30 years. Weather is highly variable. It changes from one day or one year to the next. Climate changes slowly over Mm. decades. And when we see an extreme weather event, the first instinct of a scientist is to ask, how unusual is that? Let's go back over 10, 20, 30 years, or even more. If we saw similar events before, say, 1950, when human influences were pretty darn small, then it might start to lead you to wonder, well, if we saw it when humans weren't influencing the climate and we're seeing it now, maybe it's not all humans at all, or maybe humans are even a minor role. So long, precise records are really important in understanding how the climate is changing. Hmm. Now, you referred to a couple of recent events. I'll give you one that's dear to me here in New York City. We had uh, a record rainfall in Central Park a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we saw um, in an hour, I can't remember the exact number, but some large number of inches. And then you ask, well, let's go back and understand just how uh, unusual that is. 
We don't have good hourly rainfall data going back 150 years, but we do have good daily rainfall data and go back 150 years. And when you look at that, you discover that the recent event was only the fifth rainiest day in New York City, and the rainiest day happened in 1879. Hmm. And that there are many other pretty rainy days that are spread out over the last 150 years. So not an obvious change in the climate, okay? but of course, a pretty awful weather event. You can do the same sort of thing for record high temperatures in the U.S., which are not increasing over the U.S. as a whole. You can do the same for hurricanes. And that's one that really surprises people. Mm -hmm. The official reports say there are no human influence. I'm sorry, the right way to say it is that there are no detectable long-term trends in almost all hurricane properties. So these, of course, are quite contrary to what you would take away if you were just reading the newspapers or listening to the weather presenters. Uh, absolutely. And and one of the clearest examples of um, uh, presumptions that are made about weather events or climatic events and, and the the idea that we must have had some impact in making this happening or, or we must have had a significant impact is the question of melting ice sheets. And uh, you know, when I speak in schools in the UK, I will always see, you know, the kids do these kind of paintings on their walls in the hallways. And it's always got a polar bear standing on an ice sheet, looking very hungry, very sad, very lonely. And there's this kind of moral morality tale that comes through, which is that if only we would change our behavior to become more eco-friendly, then we could save the ice sheets, we could save the polar bear, we could save these um, wonderful parts of the world. Uh, you you say that, in fact, if you look at something like Greenland's ice sheet, it hasn't. It's not shrinking any more rapidly today than it was um, eighty years ago, and that's another thing I think that people would find very surprising. So, how true is it in 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 your view and and in the research that you've done? How true is it that all the ice is melting and it's going to cause these? huge tidal waves across parts of the world. Is that another aspect of this that is driven by this filtering through off from something that begins with science but ends up being almost myth? So it's certainly true that as the planet is warming, we expect the ice sheets on land, Greenland and, and maybe to a lesser extent Antarctic, uh, to start losing mass. Uh, on the other hand, uh, as I mentioned in the book and you quoted when you look at the rates at which Greenland is losing ice, uh, it's highly variable. And it was high in the 30s, and then it was low, and then it was high again, even as the globe was warming steadily. So there's very likely a large natural variability in the ice sheets, and you've got to take that into account as a scientist if you're going to say, ha, it's humans that are causing the recent melting and of course, the, the people who want to create alarm about changing climate will point to the last couple of decades and say, see, it's going up. But they somehow don't have an explanation. We actually don't have an explanation for why it was going up uh, 80 years ago. And we'd better have that. Uh, the other thing to say is that if the ice started to melt, all expectations are it would be quite gradual. And we would have plenty of time, even according to the IPCC reports. Then the third related question is, can we actually make a difference in human influences? I'm sure you'd like to get onto that later on, yeah. uh, but that's a, obviously a third question. Spike is producing more brilliant content than ever. The best way to keep up with everything we do is by signing up for our daily newsletter. It's called Today on Spiked. Every weekday, you'll get a roundup of all Spike's content, plus some exclusive commentary from the Spike team. So to never miss a thing, go to spiked-online.com slash newsletters and sign up to Today on Spiked. One more thing I want to tease out a bit with you is the question of how how we get from one thing to another. So as you say, there is such a thing as climate science. Uh, there is such a thing as modeling, and there are problems with the models. There is such a thing as the IPCC, as we all know, and they produce reports, much some of which have very useful information and pretty good 
summaries of where things are at and and others may be a little bit a, a little more questionable but how do we go from those things uh, i want to uh, ask you about the process of how we go from those things to what is really a misunderstanding among sections of the public and certainly among campaigners and the media about how bad things are going. So you you give the example that government press releases and even UN press releases about climate issues rarely reflect the science because the science is necessarily complex. It's a huge field. It's very difficult to understand it. And the press releases often just boil that down. Do you think that's one of the key parts of this process where things are really boiled down to, I guess, a digestible message and ideally a a digestible message that will impact on people's behaviour. And is that one of the motives, do you think, that people have for making it sound simpler than it actually is? Yes, certainly the need for brevity and understandability uh, makes it difficult to talk about nuance. And this is a nuanced subject. Uh, The other is that, uh, you know, if you're trying to persuade people rather than inform them, And I firmly believe that the role of science is to inform, not to persuade, because the decisions we have to make are really complicated and are just more than just the science alone. So the people who want to persuade you uh, will certainly spin the message one way or the other. I can give you another wonderful example. Sometimes it's the IPCC itself who do that. If you look at the most recent report that was released on August 9th, uh, working group one, they have a discussion of sea level rise. And the important thing to understand about sea level is not that it's rising. It's been doing that for 15,000 years. The real question is whether it's rising more rapidly in recent decades because of human influence as opposed to its natural rate. And the IPCC, while it talks about how the rate in the last few decades is a lot greater than the average in the 20th century and so on. They entirely do not mention, let alone show a graph, showing you that around 1940, it was rising almost as rapidly as it is today, and then it went through a minimum, and now is rising rapidly again. I would say uh, I'd fail a student if they did that, because that is not at all an honest presentation of the data. And they get away with it. Yeah, that's a very useful insight into how some of this stuff works. I wonder if another, just to move it um, for a moment onto a more political plane, I wonder if another aspect of how climate science, science becomes something a bit more apocalyptic, a bit more reductionist and so on, alongside the kind of the motives that people have to filter information, to change information, to tweak things, do you think there is a receptiveness today to horror stories and to apocalyptic world views are kind of because one thing that strikes me when i hear people saying you know essentially what they often argue is we've brought this terrible weather on ourselves you know uh, plagues of locusts and floods and hurricanes you know these are things that we deserve bef- for our sinful behavior do you think there's a there's an almost religious component to this sometimes where there is this view that it's a form of flagellation by Mother Earth for the sins of mankind. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, that's a, a ancient human tendency. You can look at the Bible. Yeah. And somewhere in the Old Testament, it says, you know, God God is saying, if you obey my commandments, I'll give you seven years of good rain, and which is very important in the Middle East. Um, and so, yes. Uh, of course, and, and, you know, we, other cultures have had sacrifices of one sort or another. If we just do the right <laughs> thing, then nature will be kind to us. And I think there is certainly a component of that among the populace as a whole. There may also be something of guilt in the developed world, mm. uh, for the fact that we are living so well. If you look in the developing world, uh, the concerns about um, you know, having to rein in lifestyle are much less prevalent for obvious reasons. And so I think it is a uniquely Western thing, perhaps, you know, supplanting the absence of traditional religions that has grown uh, in recent decades. Yeah. Okay. One thing that's very interesting, and you, you touch on this quite a lot in the book, is that we have some evidence that stuff is being blown out of proportion and that exaggerations are being made about climate catastrophes and so on. 
because there have been numerous predicted catastrophes that have not actually happened. And every now and then I will see some journalist in the UK or the US who will do a list of things that were predicted, but actually didn't come to pass. And it always makes me smile. And you touch upon some of these in your writing. And I wanted just to ask you about a few of them, because I think these are actually, I mean, they are quite fun. It's quite fun to look back and see the ridiculous things people said and to realise, thankfully, they didn't materialise. But I think it's also quite important to understand that this is this is actually a way in which we can prove that there are problematic claims being made. So, for example, I remember this story very well, that within a few years, children wouldn't know what snow was, for example. And in fact, every time it snows in the UK, on my Instagram page, I post that newspaper headline to remind people that we were told, I don't know, 15 years ago, or however long it was, that there would never be any more snow. And there's actually been quite a lot of it. But you give some other examples too. For example, that there would be climatic devastation similar to a nuclear holocaust by the year 2000. That didn't happen. Weather-related deaths would rise and rise and rise. And in fact, there is evidence that they are declining. So could you just touch for a moment upon the apocalypses that ain't and, and why that's an important aspect of this work? So by and large, you see these kind of apocalyptic predictions or statements coming from non-scientists, uh, you know, uh, with the release of the recent UN report, Guterres said, code red for humanity. Yeah. But if you actually read the report, it doesn't say that at all. <laughs> and so these are people who are making a gloss on science that they don't understand uh, in order to, again, persuade or motivate people. When you read more deeply in the reports, as opposed to people who are trying to interpret the reports, you, you also discover that, you know, there's a lot of fudging going on. There was a, a report about crop yields and how they were already and would increasingly be impacted by changing climate. Well, that's really hard to say how they've already been impacted. You have to say what agriculture would have been if the climate weren't changing. And that's a very difficult thing to do. And even when they try to do that, what they come up with is relatively small, few percent changes to yields that are growing by factors of two over 40 or 50 years. So the world has more than enough food right now, and you can bet that we will be able to adapt uh, just fine as the climate changes slowly. There are other issues with food, distribution, obesity, and so on, but it's not lack of being able to grow enough stuff. The same is true of deaths. People make outrageous projections using extreme emission scenarios and very sensitive models, and then just report the upper limits in the mm. media. The papers are better, mm. but the upper limits in the media are just terrible. Mm. Absolutely. Coming back to the political angles or the political aspect of some of this, you were an undersecretary for science uh, in the Department of Energy during the uh, Obama administration in 2009, 2010, 2011. Um, so you have associations with the Democrats, including when they were uh, 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 under the Obama administration. But you talk about how the Democrats embrace of the more, or, or rather, I should say, some Democrats embrace of the more apocalyptic visions of climate change leave you cold somewhat. And I've noticed a similar dynamic in the UK where it's often the people towards the left of politics who are more uh, willing to believe these stories or, or, or rather less willing to dig down and ask awkward questions. And in fact, often, and this is something I want to ask you about as well shortly, often they will brand you a climate change denier, a terrible heretic, if you do ask these questions. W what do you think it is about uh, the current Democratic Party, the current left more broadly, that what makes them feel uh, uh, very open to these horror stories about what we've done to the planet? So I quote in the book, and it's probably worth mentioning now, uh, something that H.L. Mencken wrote in 1918. Uh, for those who, your listeners who don't know him, he was a very astute and somewhat acerbic observer, journalist observer of the U.S. scene in the early 20th century. And he wrote, and I'll read the quote, the whole aim of practical politics is to keep the populace alarmed and hence clamorous to be led to safety by menacing it with an endless series of hobgoblins, most of them imaginary. 
<laughs> and you see this played out not only with climate, mm-hmm. but here in the U.S. with immigration, with vaccination. Um, you can go on, uh, whatever the issue of the day is. And, you know, politicians need to motivate people. And the strongest motivator uh, is fear. Probably the next is greed after that, and then maybe lust, but the politicians don't get involved with that last one. Um, <laughs> and, and so, you know, it's natural for the politicians to do that. And climate is such a great motivator yeah. because it's diffuse, it's out there in the future, and to the extent that it involves energy, it touches just about everything. Uh, that society does. So how could you resist, right? Um, what disappoints me most are the scientists who know better, who remain silent while the issue is exaggerated and uh, played up for fear. Are you looking for the perfect gift for the pro-freedom, anti-woke person in your life? Then look no further than the Spiked Shop. You can now get your favourite Spiked slogan on a t-shirt, hoodie, tote bag or mug, including ban nothing, question everything, love Europe, hate the EU and cancel cancel culture. And if you're a Spike supporter, you get a 15% discount on everything in the shop. Just go to spiked-online.com slash shop to browse our items and make your purchases. That's spiked-online.com slash shop. Okay, let's talk about, you mentioned scientists. Let's talk a little bit about scientists or or science or the science. Uh, Your book is called Unsettled, of course. Uh, a title, I think, which works on many, many different levels because um, you're unsettling the idea of the settled science. And also it can be unsettling for, I think it will be unsettling for many readers to read the facts that you bring to bear and the uh, the, uh, the evidence that you bring in terms of disabusing people of lots of things that they have previ- previously believed to be true, which is what every good book should try to do, try and stir people to think in a different way, of course. So in relation to the settled science. And I want to ask you about why that's such a problematic idea, because even as someone who does not have a scientific background at all, I do have an appreciation that one of the most important things about science is its falsifiability and and it, almost an invitation to di- to prove that actually we're wrong. You know, the great thing about science is it throws itself open to criticism and critique and, and um you know, things are a theory until they really are firmly, firmly proven. For example, the theory of evolution, we're all pretty sure that's correct, uh, but it maintains that status of a theory that we we should continue talking about, continue studying. So isn't there a real problem with the idea that science can ever really be settled, and especially science in relation to something as complex as climate? So all science, science is a, a process by which we increasingly solidify our knowledge about the natural world. It starts with hypotheses, and then you do experiments, and you do more hypotheses. Eventually, you get to a theory, you do more experiments, and so on. Things can always be overturned. Our understandings can always be sometimes dramatically revolutionized. Relativity and Einstein in the early 20th century was a famous example we all thought Newton had the world nailed down. Uh, and then Einstein comes along and says, you know, it's not exactly like that. And particularly, it gets very different if things start moving as fast as the speed of light or close to the speed of light. So it's all contingent. But climate science is largely an observational science. We cannot do climate experiments. We can do some experiments in the laboratory that teach us how little pieces of the climate system work, but you can't do experiments. And in that regard, it's like geology. Uh, it's like astronomy. So that makes it more difficult to really untangle what's going on. Hmm. That's not to say we don't know anything. There are some things about the climate we're actually quite sure about. But there are many others, particularly the physically small changes that are attributed to human influences that are really quite contingent to pin down. And 
Could you say something about why you think this is problematic for science itself? I want to look at why this process is problematic for science and politics, in fact. But just firstly on science, um, what do you think it does to scientific progress or to the open-mindedness that is a necessary part of science if science goes further down this route of of playing a very politicised role or telling a rigid story that it becomes more and more difficult for anyone to question. For example, you know, young people going into science today may have a very different view of what role, what its role is than young people going into science 50 years ago, because now they will think, oh, science is that great thing that tells us what to do in the political world, uh, which I think might possibly make them bad scientists, or at least make them different scientists to the con- kinds that we had in the past. So how do you think this this idea of settled science, what does it do to science itself? And, and why aren't more scientists saying, listen, this is a real problem, guys? Yeah, I, I mean, there's, again, some scientific paradigms that are pretty well settled. Yeah. Uh, not the case here. And even the ones that are settled are always open to challenge. Uh, the president of the National Academies back in the 1980s, Phil Handler, warned about scientists getting too political. And mm. I really think that the climate scene has been corrupted by some scientists, certainly not all, in fact, a small minority, who have shifted over to an activist mode and are doing activism under the mantle of science. And I think it's very important, again, for scientists to call it like they see it, not like Mm -hmm. they would like it to be or like they portray it to be in order to motivate action. Whatever actions or responses society make is, in the end, a much more complicated decision than just whether the science is uh, saying one thing or another. We've seen that in COVID. Right. In COVID, yeah. you have a tension between the scientists who are saying, lock everything down. That's the only way to ensure uh, everybody stays healthy. Whereas there are many other parts of society who have other interests, including keeping the economy functioning. And so that's a wonderful tension between what the science might say and what society might do. But the scientists have to give an accurate portrayal of the certainties and uncertainties and risks and benefits of possible courses of action and not advocate for one or the other. I think that that's a really important point. And it actually brings me on to my next question, which is the impact that this ossification of science has on politics and on the decisions that we take for society itself. And you talk in the book about how You know, if you're talking about a trillion dollar intervention into the issue of the climate or the environment, that is really a question that has to be driven by interests and values and what society thinks it needs and what people think their society needs. But too often, I think science is used to almost circumvent the democratic process and to say, well, look, this is what the science instructs us to do and therefore we should do it. Whereas, of course, even if science were to reveal a larger impact of mankind on the climate than we had expected, or even if it were to reveal that we might cause more hurricanes and so on, even within that situation, the question of whether you would devote an extraordinary amount of society's resources to this one problem and necessarily neglect other problems is surely a question, a democratic question of balancing interests and balancing values. So do you think there's an element of this increasingly strident role that science plays, courtesy of often of politicians who want to use science almost as a kind of form of moral authority to to get things done? Do you think there's a problem that it undermines the discussions and the democratic engagement we need to work out what is actually best for society? Absolutely. You know, let me give you a concrete example. Uh, if the world were to go to net zero, uh, by 2050 is being advocated by many politicians in the UK, the US, and, and more broadly. Uh, nobody ever answers the question of how are we going to get adequate energy to the 3 billion people who do not have adequate energy yeah. in yeah. the developing world. They need that energy to develop. Who is going to provide that if you can't do coal and gas? Because those are the most inexpensive and convenient ways of getting them the energy right now. And until you answer that question, advocating for net zero is frankly immoral, in my view. Yeah, I was thinking, uh, as I was asking you that question, I was thinking precisely about that that issue of net zero. And 
the way in which it's pushed very often by comfortably off people in the West who seem to have very little regard to the trials and tribulations of people in, in the uh, underdeveloped world. And there's a recent story that China is going to cease investing in uh, certain uh, coal-powered stations overseas. And this was widely celebrated by supposedly left-wing environmentalists in the UK and elsewhere. And I was thinking to myself, hold on, loads and loads of people are going to lose work as a consequence of this. Poorer countries are going to uh, lose a, a cheap source of energy, i.e. coal. And so there, isn't there also a global aspect to this where it very often feels like the West is kind of lifting up the drawbridge and saying, well, we have our industrialized societies, courtesy of the events 200, 150 years ago. But you guys in China and India and Brazil and Africa, tough luck, it's too polluting. And, and that seems to me to be very unfair. Yeah, um, echo imperialism is a, a term <laughs> I've heard people use for that. Uh, again, I think it's immoral. You know, somebody should have asked uh, Xi or those uh, others celebrating China's action. Uh, so please tell me, how are those countries going to get energy now if you're yeah. not going to find a find it? The other thing um, I think about this net zero ignorance, let me call it that, apart from a global awareness, which most people don't have. And, and again, I say that with all humility, uh, living in the U.S. up through an adult at age 50, I did not have the kind of global understanding I have now uh, until I got into a big international company like BP. Mm. The other awareness that is missing is an awareness of the energy system. Uh, again, I use my own experience. I was a physicist uh, up until just a physicist up until about age 50, 55. And um, I knew that energy was conserved, but I had no practical understanding of energy. And I, I was fortunate to have that exposure as I moved into BP and then into the federal government. And unless you understand energy as a system and the tremendous effort and knowledge uh, that it takes to deliver reliable electricity or fuels, or heating, you can just say, well, let's go ahead and just change the whole system. And mm -hmm. I think that basic energy illiteracy, particularly among non-technical people, is at the heart of this, um, I think, unreasoned, rapid drive to net zero. I want to bring the discussion on to a, a slightly different topic, which is, the which is something you raised earlier on, in fact, which is the question of what can we do to impact on the climate? And can we do anything to impact on the climate? And uh, as a, as a lay person, I've always been very struck by this side of the discussion because it seems to flit between either encouraging us to do very, very small things like separate your rubbish or go on holiday once a year rather than twice a year and, and plant seven trees if you drive to the supermarket and all these different kinds of quite small measures, which I do think feel quite ritualistic. And it seems very much to actually alleviate people's individual sense of guilt rather than to have any impact. So on the one side, there's those very small things, which I see, I think are quite pointless and are obviously not going to prevent a, a hurricane in middle America or anything like that. Um, but then on the other side, you have these huge ideas being wheeled out, trillion dollar initiatives, the Green New Deal, net zero, which would have a, a terribly transformative impact on life as we know it. And so people get confused, I think, by this aspect of the discussion, because they're either being told, you know, put your cardboard in one bin, or they're being told you're going to suffer for the next 50 years because we need to rein in carbon use and bringing green taxes and so on. So the question I want to ask you, which I think would help some of my listeners, what can people do to impact on any of this stuff? Or is that a, 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 a fantasy as, as part of the broader fantasy that the world is coming to an end? I think at the individual level, there's very little you can do other than to vote and support people who want to take a rational approach to understanding and dealing with these problems. And let me describe what a rational approach is because what we're doing right now is not rational. Yeah. Mainstream economics literature says that there is an optimal rate at which one should decarbonize. And William Nordhaus, an economist at Yale, won the Nobel Prize in economics in 2018 for the following insight. 
If you decarbonize too rapidly, you incur a lot of costs by disrupting society and also by deploying immature technology. Mm. But if you decarbonize too slowly, you allow CO2 to build up further in the atmosphere and perhaps incur more risk. And so there's an optimal pace. And when you look at his analysis and, and those of others subsequently, the optimal pace would let the global temperature rise to three or three and a half degrees at the end of the century, rather than the one and a half or two degrees that is being advocated by people around the Paris Accord. And therefore, the best thing to do is, of course, keep watching the climate, uh, understand it, watch it change, and at the same time, develop low-cost technologies and be ready to deploy them on an economically optimal path. So to say it in a somewhat more blunt way, as usual, the politicians have gotten out over their skis with respect to what the science actually says about how rapidly we need to be dealing with these problems. Yeah. And in the book, you touch upon what you've just been discussing there, which is the question of, of adaptation and the likelihood at some point where we will have to adapt to uh, things that might change. You know, the world changes all the time and it things go, go well, go badly, go up, go down. But there is so little honest, open, serious, rational discussion about adapting to the changing climate. And instead it becomes this the fool's errand of trying to hold back the weather and hold back the sunshine and hold back the sea in this kind of slightly medieval way. So could you outline how you think adapting to this would work? And and surely that would be the cheaper option and also the more rational option. Adaptation is what I believe the world will do. I, as you know, in the book, I try to away, I try to stay away from telling people or nations what they should do. Yeah. But just present the facts. But adaptation is what the nations will do. And it works remarkably well. Consider that since 1900, we've seen the greatest advance in human well-being ever mm -hmm. in the human species. And that happened as the globe warmed by 1.1 degrees. It's kind of absurd to say that another one and a half degrees uh, over the next 80 or 100 years is going to significantly derail that. Mm -hmm. We are wonderful at adapting. Uh, up until about eight or 10 years ago, you didn't see much discussion of adaptation uh, because it was thought to distract from the favored strategy, which was mitigation. But mm -hmm. I think within the last decade, even the IPCC is saying, now you've got to uh, include adaptation as a healthy measure of the response. The problem is adaptation is largely a local uh, game. Uh, you build a seawall or the Thames barrier in the UK. Uh, you change the crops that you plant slowly. Uh, it's very hard to enunciate general principles or general costs other than that go slow and be proportional uh, and don't adapt too much and try not to adapt too little. So it, it's a difficult thing to put a framework around. Okay, Stephen, my, my last question for you. Um, we've just had a very reasonable, rational discussion about the problems facing mankind and where they're being exaggerated and, and what might be done about them. But as you will be aware, having this kind of discussion in the contemporary period is becoming more and more difficult because we live in a culture where People are too often shut down. People are very often demonized. And around the issue of climate change in particular, that's often very pronounced as a tactic. So you will be called or one will be called a climate change denier, even if one accepts that climate change is happening. You will often be treated as a heretic. Uh, I've heard some environmentalists openly talking about the possibility that there should be um trials of people who have denied climate change because they will have impacted so terribly on, on our world. There's a very uh, severe atmosphere around this issue and a lack of freedom of speech and a lack of open thinking. So do you, how problematic do you think that has become? And what do you think needs to be done to ensure that a more reasoned and free debate can be had about climate change? First of all, I, I think we do need to have a debate, but we should debate values and priorities and uh, costs and benefits of actions rather than debating the science itself. And mm -hmm. I have yeah. tried, and I think the, the appropriate tactic uh, 
is to show people what the official reports, whether it's the literature or the assessment reports, actually say. And everything I've written in the book is right out of those sources. Uh, when people see that, uh, and they still call me a denier, maybe we can then have a discussion about who's denying what. Right? <laughs> yeah. You know, so, so people really just don't understand what the science says. And again, it's not as though there isn't an issue here or a potential problem to be watching and thinking about how to deal with, but a headlong rush to zero carbon on such a grand scale is just so counterproductive and will ultimately, I think, be a greater threat than the changing climate itself. Stephen, thank you very much. Great to be chatting with you. Thank you for listening to The Brendan O'Neill Show. We'll be back with another guest and more discussion. Don't forget to subscribe. And in the meantime, keep reading Spiked at www.spiked-online.com.